to have a decent life. And uh, we, we are very much committed to trying to do what we can to, uh, to, to have a better life for everybody. It, there are, uh, Quakers are integrated in a lot of places and um, it would be lovely. Um, we bought this house hoping that it, would, it was in an integrated neighborhood and hoping that it would be integrated. It hasn't really, we have had people come and go a little, but um, it, I don't know. Uh, I understand that if I joined the NAACP, then I could be working with a black group. And, um, and that's, they're doing important things. Um, but I feel that my calling is more than that. My calling is broader than that. And I think um, it's, I don't know the answer to your question. I don't know how, how that could be overcome, except by in, a, in an integrated neighborhood. Now, we, it's, it's really nice here. This part of it is that children are playing on our play, they come and play on our playground equipment, and they don't know a difference in color. And they have, it's a very nice place, a good feeling, They're, they play well together. And at least that's the beginning. <laughs> well, I think this is a, should be a great, great concern for people that are in the peace and justice movement, that often membership or participation in the movement itself is so separate in terms of race. Uh, when I came to uh, Cincinnati back in 1945, that is my mother and aunt, and I've lived here almost 45 years now, right in the neighborhood. Uh, when we came here, the neighborhood was 70% uh, Afro-American. And uh, I soon uh, heard people say, uh, some talk about the Negro invasion. Well, of course, it wasn't the Negro invasion, it was a white retreat. And the church, uh, the combined church to which I came, I was all white. Both congregations were white, and they were having trouble financially, and they came together to survive. Well, the way to survive is to be a community church, a church for everyone, to survive spiritually and financially and, and every other way. Well, I think one thing that they're on the agenda of uh, the white groups which are predominantly white, with a sprinkling often of black people, this definitely should be on, on the agenda. Uh, what all this, these millions of dollars that have gone into around the world, and El Salvador is still going, and uh, what's happened in Nicaragua and other places, this money has been withdrawn from our great cities, primarily from African American people, because of job discrimination and everything that goes with it. And so they're not dying as quickly. But they're dying because of malnutrition. Now they're withdrawing more money from the WIC program. I think that there, this should be uh, a part, if the people are going to be drawn in uh, to a predominantly white group, they're going to have to hear once in a while the concern of those in the group about discrimination, about malnutrition, about drugs. Uh, I attended this meeting uh, when William Bennett was here over at Laurel Holmes a few weeks ago, and they used the term a war on drugs. Well, drugs are used by people, and I think it's, it turns out it's sort of a war on people. It should be a term, a war on frustration, discrimination, joblessness. If these things are taken care of and people have a feeling of self-affirmation, that other people care. And I think that we need to, to identify, not only verbally, but to get acquainted. We should go to more meetings where black people are involved. It is true that there are enough, enough of blacks in the white, in the peace movement, which is mostly white. And surely there are enough, not enough whites in the justice movement which uh, is mostly black. But I see it all as one part, one war, one part of the same war. Uh, there are things you emphasize. For instance, when we started out, we were fighting for strict 
justice, equality, fairness, recognition that we were people, uh, the right to sit at a lunch counter, which was elementary, uh, the right to walk up and down a street without uh, being harassed, beaten up. Uh, and of course, the nation began to look at this and we began to realize that we got, we've been saying some pious phrases about America, the land of the free and the home of the brave for years, but we really are not doing it. And then as you think of one thing you begin rectifying, you see so much other. For instance, you can paint one room in a house and then all the rest of them look terrible. They didn't look so bad before you paint that one room. Or you can press a pair of pants, then you, you look at other things. So that we found that there was so much more, and even there, even with what we're doing now, there is much more to make the total justice an equality system. We even talking about economic justice now. We didn't hear that word a few years ago, but it's because poverty has a loom, and people, uh, the country is bankrupted now, but almost because of the military situation. We got enough warships to save the world, and the world is being saved without warships. Maybe God, what he said was right. They shall rise up, beat their swords to plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Still they war no more. I believe all white people ought to be in the justice of the movement because America is a land of the free and the home of the brave, so that there's no place for anybody who calls himself an American, white or black, out of the justice section. Now we've kind of put it in different boxes, but I see it as one battle to free the human spirit, free the human mind, to lift the human soul and to take care of the human needs. And in it, I think everybody belongs. And I would hope that the young people, particularly the young college students, could get back into action as they did one time, even in the peace movement and lead this nation to another level, another dimension of freedom and justice and striving for brotherhood in this country. Because we knew this was an all-white community, this whole hillside, and we knew that the whole area had no black people in it. And of course this was a great hurdle to overcome. We wanted to, and of course we weren't here more than a day or so before people noticed the color of people going in and out of the house and I think one for one day they thought that Marin and I and Lloyd had some servants here and that was all right with them I guess. But about the second day they began to find out that we were all living here as a community and the whole place really blew up. It was something that we could only assess because we didn't have any friends around here who were telling us what was going on, but we could see what was happening. A good deal of flurry, a good deal of racing by the house, phone calls, beacon lights shone on the house, and uh, meetings over to the church, <clears throat> which were attended by so many cars that had been lined up and down the road all around here. And then we were approached by somebody, I guess the an attorney for these people who said we had to get out of here. Wally was working at the Finley Street neighborhood house at that time, and he came home one day and saw something on the kitchen table and picked it up and said, what's this? And somebody said, well, that's a ticket for a church supper over there at the church tonight. Some girl in the neighborhood came by selling tickets, and because she wanted to sell tickets, and she came here, and we bought one and to be friendly, and he got very serious. He picked that thing up and looked at it. He said, well, anybody going to use it? And uh, everybody was flabbergasted because nobody had any idea of using it. We just bought it. And he said very solemnly, well, then I think I'll use it. And everybody was really surprised because they realized what drama would occur if he took that ticket and went over there to sit down at supper with these people. And so I said, well,